Have you noticed that as we get older, it seems easier and easier to pack on belly fat and harder and harder to take it off? It's not your imagination, and it's not because you lack willpower. With aging, there's a redistribution of our adipose tissue to different areas of the body, along with alterations in cellular, metabolic, and molecular activity that not only predispose us to weight gain, but also increase our risk of a number of chronic conditions. In this video, we'll break down what these changes in adipose tissue are and how they affect our health. Let's get to it. Even though the messages on social media make it seem like body fat is our enemy, adipose tissue is critical to our survival. Brown fat is a key source of heat production, and white adipose tissue is a reservoir for energy storage and release, and it functions as a dynamically active endocrine organ that communicates with multiple other organs and tissues in the body to modulate metabolism and immune function. So body fat is important for keeping us healthy, but this can shift as we age or if we accumulate too much of it. For today, we'll focus on the impact of aging on white adipose tissue, which in many ways mirrors the changes that occur with weight gain. If we look at the structure of white adipose tissue, it's composed of fat cells or adipocytes in a vascular web called the stromal vascular fraction that also contains pre-adipocytes, endothelial cells, macrophages, and other immune cells. White adipose tissue is stored in two main sites, the visceral region surrounding our organs in the peritoneal cavity and in the subcutaneous tissues, predominantly in the gluteal and femoral regions, or our buttocks and thighs. When we have an energy surplus, i.e. we've consumed more calories than we've burned, subcutaneous white adipose tissue is the largest and safest depot of the body that's able to expand to accommodate large amounts of lipids without compromising metabolic health. And there are two pathways that it can do this. One is by hypertrophy, increasing the size of individual adipose cells, or through hyperplasia, which involves increasing the number of adipocytes through inducing stem cells to differentiate into preadipocytes and then proliferate and mature into full adipocytes. As long as this adipogenesis or formation of new fat process is available to us, our metabolic health is maintained, even if we're accumulating more body fat. But each of us has a limit that's thought to be genetically determined of how much surplus we can accommodate through hyperplasia and beyond that, hypertrophy becomes the sole pathway to store excess energy. But as the adipose cell size increases, it becomes more difficult for oxygen to diffuse into the cell. And this leads to hypoxia and cell death, followed by infiltration of macrophages and deposition of collagen that makes the tissue become fibrotic with less cell membrane flexibility. The end result of this is dysfunction of the subcutaneous white adipose tissue which is associated with increased release of inflammatory factors that suppress insulin signaling and divert energy excess towards storage in the visceral adipose tissue. With aging, even without an energy surplus, there's hypertrophic growth of adipocytes that is thought to be due to downregulation in mitochondrial activity. And there is also functional decline in the adipocyte progenitor cells such that they are not only less efficient at replicating and differentiating into mature adipocytes, there's also interruption of the cell cycle, which results in accumulation of senescent cells. And these are cells that are arrested in the maturation process. They lose their capacity to multiply, but they persist, so they don't die off, and they continue to release inflammatory chemical mediators, and they also decrease supportive molecules involved in systemic energy balance, like leptin and adiponectin. Leptin is a hormone that acts primarily in the brain to modulate appetite, and a decrease in serum leptin levels is a starvation signal to the central nervous system that leads to adaptations that increase food intake and decrease energy expenditure. Adiponectin is also a hormone that functions systemically to regulate glucose and fatty acid breakdown, and it also has anti-inflammatory effects that help reduce the risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So the senescent cells cause decreases in these two supportive hormones. In addition to the changes in the adipose cells themselves, with aging there are also alterations in the immune cells in the stromal vascular fraction, such as a shift from anti-inflammatory M2 macrophages to the M1 pro-inflammatory cell type. There are also increases in inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6 and changes in the balance of immune B and T lymphocytes. So with aging, things are going awry along the hypertrophy and hyperplasia pathways 
with accumulation of senescent cells, inflammatory macrophages, and B and T lymphocytes, all of which have an end result of increasing the inflammatory mediators and decreasing release of the helpful hormones. In this scenario of dysfunctional subcutaneous white adipose tissue, excess free fatty acids are shunted towards increase in visceral fat stores. At baseline, men have more visceral adipose tissue stores than women who have more gluteal and thigh subcutaneous adipose tissue during adulthood, which by the way, some studies suggest has a protective health effect. But as we age, decreases in sex hormones, particularly the precipitous drop in estrogen postmenopause for women, results in a shift toward increased visceral fat stores for men and women. Although both subcutaneous and visceral white adipose tissue play a role in lipid storage, they have vastly different effects. Visceral adipose tissue overall is much more inflammatory. And as the cycle of adipose tissue dysfunction progresses, both in subcutaneous and visceral fat stores, any caloric excess then leads to fat accumulation in other sites, like the liver, the muscles, and around the heart. And visceral adipose tissue poses a particular risk for fatty liver disease because visceral fat has a greater capacity to generate free fatty acids, and these drain directly through the portal vein to the liver. But no matter where it's deposited, ectopic fat impairs function. For example, increased muscle fat contributes to sarcopenia, Increases in fat stores in bone is associated with osteoporosis or low bone density. And the low-grade chronic inflammation in general from adipose tissue has wide-ranging systemic effects such as glucose intolerance, insulin resistance, and development of type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, dementia, and even osteoarthritis, which is no longer seen as only a wear and tear type disease of the joints. So given all of these changes, what can we do? And of course, there is intense research going on to try to find drugs or gene therapies that will short circuit some of these processes of aging. But what can we as individuals do right now without a prescription or a pill? First and foremost, I'd say go easy on yourself if you've added a few pounds. We're so accustomed to attaching judgment to body weight and much of that we turn on ourselves and that stress and negativity doesn't help the situation. But having a thicker middle is as much a part of the process of aging as developing wrinkles or our hair turning gray. And that's not to say that we should resign ourselves to these changes, because we do know that continued increases in visceral adipose tissue are associated with chronic illnesses and it's associated with early mortality. That said, I think the two most important actions you can take to start with are, number one, throw away your scale, and number two, go for a walk. In a future video, I'll discuss this article that convincingly shows that low fitness levels are a bigger risk to your health than having a high body mass. Physical activity, even if you don't lose weight, can improve cardiometabolic function and reduce mortality risk. And at any level of intensity, physical activity can help reverse some of the age-related changes in adipose tissue, and it induces a huge cascade of anti-inflammatory factors that are protective for our overall health. And low intensity exercise in particular, like walking, primarily uses fatty acids rather than carbohydrates for fuel. So over time, it can help reduce body fat and change overall body composition. Yes, of course, the ideal approach is to combine caloric restriction with aerobic exercise and strength training. But trying to implement wholesale changes all at once like this can be overwhelming and a setup for failure. So quiet the self-critical voices in your head and go for a 10 minute walk. Start simply and measure how you feel instead of what you weigh. I'm gonna get to work on this other video that I mentioned, but in the meantime, you can check out this one that goes through the minimum amount of activity we need to have a big impact on longevity. Or you can take a look at this that explains the components of cardiorespiratory fitness. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.